Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is the Panasonic Lumix G100, a compact mirrorless camera designed for vlogging and creative video, although it's also perfectly good for still photos. Announced in June 2020, Panasonic let me try out an almost final model for this first looks video where I'll show you what it can do. The G100 is probably best described as a mini G90 or G95 and costs 679 UK pounds or 749 US dollars in a kit with the 12 to 32 mm zoom. In the micro four thirds world, that's equivalent to 24 to 64 mil. This lens is a collapsing design which needs to be twisted to the 12 mil position before you can start shooting. When you're ready, flick the switch around the mode dial to power up, note the generously sized video record button, then round about you have the choice of composing with the screen or an electronic viewfinder. The price point rules out an OLED panel, so Panasonic has opted for an LCD, which to my rather sensitive eyes suffered from a few rainbow artifacts as I glanced around, but it's nowhere near as bad as a field sequential panel. On the plus side, it's a very large image. Meanwhile, the 3 inch screen is a side hinged, fully articulated design which can flip and twist to any position, and it also inherits Panasonic's broad range of touch controls. There's no tally light to indicate when you're recording, but the screen does provide good feedback not just with the usual red icon, but also with an optional red border around the frame to show when you're rolling. In terms of battery, the BLG 10E pack should be good for around 270 photos or up to 90 minutes of 1080 video. The Lumix G100 is equipped with a 3.5mm microphone input that's considerately positioned above the screen hinge, allowing you to connect a microphone and not have the cable block the display. I have my Rode Wireless Go connected here and you'll hear it in action later. On the right hand side are the micro USB and micro HDMI ports. The former can be used for charging but not powering the camera and sadly you can't use it as a USB webcam with Panasonic's recent software. You can, however, take the HDMI output and use that with an HDMI capture device and a clean option is available. Note that the HDMI is only available up to 1080p, sadly there's no 4K over HDMI and there's no 10-bit either. There's no headphone output either, an advantage of the G90. Panasonic has equipped the G100 with its most recent 20 megapixel micro four thirds sensor, the same I believe as the G90 or G95 which means the photo quality should also match the G9. This also means the G100 employs Panasonic's contrast-based DFD autofocus system, which is quick for single AF but can't help lacking the greater confidence of rival phase detect autofocus systems, especially when it comes to continuous tracking. That said, in my video tests it held onto the subject better than say the Canon G7X series and I'll show you a bunch of examples in just a moment. Note the G100 does however lack the sensor stabilisation of the higher end bodies in the series, so you'll be relying on lens based optical or electronic stabilisation to reduce the wobbles. If you want IBIS, get the G90. Before launching into video, here's a bunch of photos I took with the G100 and 12-32 and all the JPEGs straight out of camera. Like the G90 and G9 before it, I actually find the 20 megapixel resolution more than enough for general photography and I'm satisfied by the degree of detail here, although the 12 to 32 kit zoom isn't as flexible or as good quality as the 12 to 60 zoom in the G90 bundles. Like all micro four thirds cameras, the quality looks best at lower sensitivities, so I'd try to stay below 1600 ISO for the best results. If you regularly photograph in very dim conditions or at high ISOs, you should consider a camera with either a bigger sensor or just get yourself a brighter lens. Luckily, with the Micro Four Thirds mount, the G100 has access to a wealth of alternative lenses if you desire, including many with very bright apertures that help keep the sensitivity down. Moving on to movies, the G100 can film 720p at 25 or 30p. 1080 at 24 to 60p at up to 28 megabits per second, or 4K in 24, 25 or 30p, all at 100 megabits per second. Clips are limited to half an hour for 1080 when filming up to 30p, reducing to 20 minutes when you're filming at 50 or 60p, or just 10 minutes per clip in 4K. The larger G90 or G95 allows unlimited recording times, and if you disable the heat warnings, the Sony ZV-1 can also record longer than half an hour. High speed video has been moved to a new S and Q or slow and quick position on the mode dial. Like Sony, this lets you record videos that are faster or slower than normal, with a maximum slowdown of four times in 1080. Here's a clip I filmed in the slowest mode, which is effectively filming 1080 at 100p before then slowing it in camera by four times for 25p output. With content creation and social sharing in mind, the G100 offers a bunch of guides that indicate a wide variety of crops and aspect ratios, from cinemascope movies to vertical phone shapes and pretty much everything in between. 
You can also dim the outer areas to make it easy to concentrate on the portion you'll be cropping later. The G100 can also detect vertical video and maintain the orientation when copied to a phone or editor, while one of the function buttons on the camera provides a shortcut by default to fire up the Wi-Fi connection for transferring pictures and videos. As a camera aimed at vloggers, it's not surprising to find Panasonic also offering a tripod grip accessory, the DMW SHG R1, which is also compatible with a bunch of firmware updated older models, including the G9, G90, and GH5. It connects to the micro USB port and offers buttons to take photos, start and stop recording, or send the camera to sleep, while the grip itself opens up into three legs to become a mini tripod. It's very reminiscent in design to those Manfrotto mini tripods, isn't it? But it's smaller and I found it a very useful accessory for the G100, whether you're filming handheld or as an ad hoc stand. Keep an eye open for deals on the G100 kit that include it. One of the most interesting aspects of the G100 are its built-in microphones. It has three in all, two on either side of the viewfinder head as normal, but an extra one towards the rear. The G100 uses Nokia's Ozo system, also available on some smartphones, to provide a degree of audio directionality, attempting to focus on the subject or embracing ambient surroundings. There's five modes to choose from. Tracking works with face detection to focus the microphone on your face as you move around. Front forces the microphones to just focus straight ahead. Back uses the rear positioned microphone to more clearly record sounds coming from behind the camera, like when you're narrating a scene, while surround uses all three mics at the same time to capture greater ambience. When tracking is enabled, you'll see little green icons on either side of the face detection frame, almost like little cute ears, to indicate the mics should also now be following your position and paying less attention to other sounds around them. OK, now for a bunch of examples showing it all working together in practice. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is a quick vlogging test with the Panasonic Lumix G100, a camera which is designed specifically for vlogging. So I'm going to show you a bunch of different clips to demonstrate the various modes and features that it has. I'm filming with the supplied 12 to 32 millimeter kit zoom. That's a pretty compact lens that collapses to make it more portable. I've got it set to 12 millimeter, so that's 24 mil equivalent. This is as wide as it's going to get. Filming in 1080 at 25p, as you'll see later on, if you start filming in 4K or applying stronger electronic stabilization, you will incur a crop. So that field of view is only going to get smaller from this point on. I also have it open to the maximum aperture at this focal length of f3.5. So this is also the maximum amount of blurring that you're going to get behind you. Let me know how you think that looks. And in terms of stabilization, I'm using optical stabilization in the lens and I have electronic stabilization set to standard. You can also turn it off or go for a higher mode that I'll show you in just a moment. And I'm holding the camera using the vlogging stand handle accessory, holding it with one hand now or with two hands. But perhaps most interestingly of all about this camera, are the audio modes. Now it has three built-in microphones and this allows it to actually apply various directional capabilities. Now I have it set here to the tracking mode and this is linked to face detection. And I can see that it's working because when I look at the screen, I can see little kind of green ears, if you like, on the sides of the face detection frame. And they show that the camera is actually gonna to attempt to track me audio wise as I move across the frame. So if I was to go from one side to the other, hopefully my audio levels should remain pretty consistent throughout. It certainly looks pretty neat in terms of graphics on the screen, but let me know if you think that's working well. How do you know if it's working well? Well, let's compare it to some of the other audio modes. Right, now I've switched to the microphone set to front. So if I move from one side to the other, you may hear the audio levels go up and down depending on how close to the center axis that I am. And obviously, as I turn it away from me and I keep talking, well, you're not going to hear me when I show you the view because I'm now behind the camera. But there is a trick to that, as I will show you in just a moment, because there is a mode which allows you to concentrate that audio direction to the rear. Let's try it out. OK, I've now set the audio directionality to rear or back. So hopefully this is concentrating the microphones to behind the camera. I shouldn't sound as good now as I did previously, but if I was to turn the camera around to show you the view of these lovely wooded lands here, then hopefully you'll be able to hear me a lot clearer. So this is the mode you should go for if you're behind the camera and you want to do some narration and tell people what it is they're looking at. And there's one more mode that I want to show you, or rather let you listen to. 
Okay, the final audio mode to demonstrate to you is surround. So this is using the microphones to pick up sound from all around me. So it should be a bit more ambient. You should be able to hear some of the breeze through the trees, the branches creaking or <laughs> blowing around, the bird song. So let me know what you think. Hopefully this should let you really capture the kind of audio atmosphere that you're after to go with your video. And I'm really pleased to see that Panasonic is uh, trying something different here. Of course, we've also seen something similar with the Sony SV-1 vlogging camera that also has three built-in microphones. And it also has something that the Panasonic doesn't have, which is a supplied fluffy dead cat accessory, which you can perch on top of the microphones to really get, get rid of or reduce some of that wind noise. Now it has suddenly become a little bit breezy here so you tell me how you think that wind noise sounds. I do have some wind cancelling enabled at the moment. It's set to standard. Depending on the movie quality and electronic stabilisation, the G100 applies a variety of crops with the strongest reserved when filming in 4K and or with electronic stabilisation set to high. Here's some comparisons to show you the impact in practice. Okay, to test the directionality of the microphones, I've got them set to face the front at the moment, but yet I am behind the camera. And this is also giving me an opportunity to show you the coverage. This is at 1080 50p with all stabilization disabled. Now let's switch those mics around. Now I've set the built-in microphones to the rear pattern. This is the rear facing pattern, so hopefully this should sound a lot clearer with me narrating behind the camera. So once again, this is 1080 at 50p without any stabilization applied. And this is with the 12 to 32 at 12 millimeter. Now I've enabled electronic stabilization. This is the standard mode for 1080 video. And now I've set the electronic stabilization to high. Again, this is 1080 video. Now I've switched to 4K video. This is at 25p. Can you tell the difference in quality? And this is being filmed without any stabilization at all. So this is the standard 4K crop without any stabilization applied. Still filming in 4K at 25p. This is with electronic stabilization set to standard. And finally, here's 4K at 25p with the electronic stabilization set to high. So this is the maximum stabilization mode. And just for some atmosphere here, I've set the built-in microphone to its surround mode. So it should be picking up sound from all around the camera, me behind the camera, but also all the bird sounds, the sea, the cars, everything, giving you the full Brighton Beach experience. And I'm filming this in 4K at 25p with the electronic stabilization disabled. And now here's the impact that those crops have when you're vlogging. Right, now I'm filming indoors in my shopping mall corridor test. And this is at 1080 25p at 12 mil f 3.5. And I've got it on the vlogging stand. So I'm holding it out one handed. This is with optical stabilization only. Now let's enable some of those stabilization modes. Okay, now I've enabled electronic stabilization. This is the standard mode still with the 12 to 32 at 12 mil f3.5. Now let's try the highest form of stabilization. Right, now I've enabled electronic stabilization and set it to high. So this is a combination of the strongest electronic and the optical stabilization in the lens working together. And I'm holding this as far away as I can. I'm completely at arm's length here with the 12 to 32 at 12 mil. So you can see there is quite a crop when you have the electronic stabilization fully enabled. Let's try a bit of 4K now. Now I've switched to 4K at 25p. This is using optical stabilization in the lens only. So this is not with the benefit of any extra digital electronic stabilization, but let me switch that on now and see what happens. Right, still filming in 4K at 25p, but this time with electronic stabilization set to standard. So this is a bit of electronic stabilization and the optical stabilization in the lens. And I'm holding this at arm's length. Let's switch it to the best setting. Ooh, that's looking a bit tight now, isn't it? This is in 4K with the electronic stabilization set to high and the optical stabilization alone. So this is the maximum stabilization mode on the G100, filming in 4K, so this is its best quality. But if you're using the kit zoom, that's the 12 to 32, even at 12 mil and at arm's length, this is as far as you are gonna get. The G100's built-in microphones do a pretty good job, but they can't perform miracles. As soon as you start getting further away from the camera, or if you're filming in a fairly echoey room as I am now, well, that quality is gonna deteriorate. 
I'm filming this clip in 4K 25p using the built-in microphones and I've got them set to tracking. But I think we can do much better than that by using an external microphone and of course that is one of the benefits of the G100 because it has a microphone input. Okay, now I've switched over to my trusty Rode Wireless Go. You may see the transmitter unit here connected to my collar. And of course, the benefit of using a lapel-based microphone is that it's not dependent on the distance between you and the camera, only between your mouth and the microphone itself. So if I just walk slowly backwards here, you'll notice that my sound quality will stay exactly the same. And this, of course, opens up opportunities like those classic news intro pieces to camera where here I am at the scene of the news walking slowly towards you and hopefully this will also be a test for the camera to refocus on me coming towards you keep an eye on the fairy lights behind me are they pulsing or are they staying fairly constant in fact I'm going to retest this by going a little bit closer to the camera I'm still filming this in 4k at 25p with a 12 to 32 millimeter kit zoom at roughly halfway through its range and with the maximum aperture at that point, which is a fairly meager f5.4, so don't expect much blurring in this instance. That is the disadvantage of this compact kit zoom. And if you're a fan of grading, you'll be pleased to learn that Panasonic has included the V-Log L profile on the Lumix G100, making it one of their most affordable cameras with this profile. And as you can see, it records very, very flat footage that is perfect for grading later. Now, not all vlogging involves filming yourself as you wander through woods or shopping malls. Some vloggers prefer to sit at home behind the desk and actually show you the objects that they're talking about. So I'm going to see how the G100 performs in that regard with a series of objects that get progressively smaller and more challenging to focus on. So first up, a tasty pineapple. Now, if I move this to the side of the frame so that my face is revealed, the G100 will probably refocus on me with its face detection. Now, you may like that approach, or alternatively, you may prefer it to remain focused on the subject that's closest, regardless of whether you're in the frame as well. In which case, you might like the Sony ZV-1's product showcase mode because that prioritizes anything that's closer, even if you're still visible in the frame. All right, next up, some official Camera Labs merchandise, which is available from my uh, merch store, along with some t-shirts. You can get that with a link below the video. Now for a bit of a bigger challenge. Here is an accessory, one of my favorite uh, recent ones. This is a Wu Hoto uh, clamp for a phone. Now, because this is small, the camera is struggling to focus on that or to find it unless I give it a bigger target by doing that classic vlogging trick of putting my hand behind it. And if you're a vlogger who likes to talk about, say, cosmetics, then you're gonna be dealing with even smaller targets. So here is a, an eyeshadow crayon type pencil. As you can see, the camera is really struggling to focus on that. Again, unless I put my hand behind it and give it a bigger target to focus on. You can, of course, use the G100 for filming subjects other than yourself, and here's some clips I shot with it in 4K from behind the camera. As you saw previously, filming in 4K does incur quite a crop, which becomes even tighter when you apply electronic stabilisation, most of all when it's set to high. This means wide shots become harder to capture, but conversely, you may enjoy the longer reach. And now, it's time for my verdict so far. The Lumix G100 is one of the most compact mirrorless cameras around, but packs a decent feature set with a built-in viewfinder, fully articulated side hinge screen, external microphone input, and a clever built-in three mic system. Panasonic may be pitching it primarily at vloggers, but it also makes for a very nice compact general purpose camera that can take different lenses. I was very fond of the earlier GM series, and in a way, the G100 is their spiritual successor. In terms of vlogging, the G100 ticks several important boxes, including a screen that faces forward, an input for an external mic and a hot shoe to mount it, as well as a decent built-in sound system that's effective whether you're in front or behind the camera. Now, your mileage will vary regarding stabilization, but I found the combination of optical and the standard electronic stabilization delivered pretty good results, although do beware of the tighter crop when using the strongest electronic mode. Filming in 4K also incurs a very tight crop even without any stabilisation, making it far less suitable for vlogging or even just for those who like to see more of their surroundings. As for autofocus, the G100's contrast-based system was good, certainly better than the Canon G7X in my tests, but not as confident as the better phase detect rivals, so do be warned if you enjoy moving back and forth when filming. 
The most obvious rival for the G100 is Sony's ZV-1, with both costing around the same amount. The G100 has the benefit of a viewfinder and interchangeable lenses, as well as a built-in microphone system that's better at picking up sound from behind. But the ZV-1 has a more confident autofocus system, longer recording clips, more practical 4K, and the simple benefit of a windshield accessory for its built-in microphones. Revealingly, while the G100 does have a bigger sensor, its kit lens couples it with a dimmer aperture, so the overall quality and potential for background blurring is actually quite similar, unless of course you swap the lens on the Panasonic, but that may mean losing optical stabilisation. It's a tough choice, although I feel for pure vlogging and video creation, the combination of more confident autofocusing and less severe cropping, especially in 4K, makes the Sony ZV-1 preferable. Conversely, as an all-rounder, the G100 is more tempting with its viewfinder and the chance to switch lenses. That said, if you like the idea of a Micro Four Thirds camera with interchangeable lenses, do keep an eye on the price of the G90 or G95 as it gives you IBIS, unlimited recording, an OLED viewfinder, headphone jack and a more flexible kit zoom for not a great deal more. Meanwhile, Canon ZL750, which also comes in at roughly the same price as the G100, remains a compelling choice for vloggers with excellent auto-focusing so long as you forget about 4K video. The choice is yours, although I do love that both Sony and Panasonic are now taking built-in microphones much more seriously with far improved audio as a result. That's it for this first looks review. Let me know what you think of the G100, especially when compared to the Sony ZV-1. Which one would you buy and why? Thanks for watching, sorry about my rather hoarse voice in this video, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.